everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Um, so for my capstone, I focused on reaching landowners um, and exploring the role of outreach as a tool for land trust. I partnered with the Mountain Area Land Trust based in Evergreen, Colorado, um, and um, we'll go over a little bit about um, my summer with them. Okay, so just a little bit of an overview um, of the presentation today. Um, we'll start off with some background and introduction, just to give you guys a basis um, of our setting um, and the problem at hand. Um, we'll go into the project overview, just some of the goals and objectives I originally started out with this summer. Um, we'll go into the methodology, um, just what informed the creation of my outreach plan. And then we'll go into the actual components of the outreach toolkit. And then finally, we'll do some reflections and learning um, of just how my summer went overall. Okay, so let's start with some Land Trust 101. Um, so what is a land trust? A land trust is an organization, typically a nonprofit organization, that utilizes conservation easements to protect land and or wildlife, depending on its mission. Um, the land trust agrees to hold a title or rights to a property for the benefit of the landowner. And land trust can acquire an entire property or can hold certain rights to the property. Um, when we're talking about rights, typically we're talking about development rights, but it also can be mineral or water rights, um, various things like that. Um, that's all agreed upon in the contract with that landowner. Um, so land trusts utilize um, conservation easements as a tool um, to conserve their mission. Um, so a conservation easement, or in this case, a CE is short for that, just so you guys know what we're talking about. But a CE is a voluntary legal agreement between a landowner and or a land trust or government entity um, that permanently restricts um, certain aspects of land use in order to protect the conservation values of the property. So landowners may either donate or sell a conservation easement. Um, and when they do place a conservation easement on their property, they do maintain ownership and they can sell that property. Um, but those con that conservation easement will stay with that property for forever. Um, so it's very hard to get it reversed. Um, requires, a, qu requires a lot of litigation. Um, so that's why they say it's in perpetuity. So these conservation easements are really not going away. Um, it's bound to the land. Um, but all of those um, restrictions are agreed upon with the landowner and the land trust. Um, so, yes, um, my um, my mentor for CLTL was Bergen Thompson. He works at Eagle Valley Land Trust. Um, and so originally he explained land trust in this analogy. Um, so the landowner has a box of colored pencils um, and then they give the land trust one or two or three colored pencils from their pack. Um, and that land trust holds those you know, few colored pencils for forever and they don't do anything with them. They just hold them. Um, and then that landowner maintains ownership of that colored pencil. They still have it. They can do whatever they want with that. But that land trust just has certain aspects of that colored pencil. So I thought that that was just a good analogy, um, kind of explaining how you kind of separate the land from those development rights. Okay. So there's multi-directional benefits to conservation easements, including to the landowner, um, to the environment, and then to the community or society as a whole. Um, so benefits to the landowner are typically financial incentives. Um, so these are state income tax credits, federal income tax deductions, um, estate tax benefits, and a reduction in property taxes. And then there's also some personal motives that go along with that as well, such as protecting your livelihood and leaving a legacy, just some of those family values. Um, there's also benefits to the environment, um, which is protection of wildlife and their habitat. Um, so kind of protecting it from that fragmentation that happens with development. Um, and that depends on each land trust mission. Um, we also have protection of ecological functions, um, such as protecting wetlands that clean water um, and filter out those impurities. Um, we also have restoration. Some land trusts will choose to restore a property, especially if they outright own that. Um, so that's obviously benefiting the environment because it's restoring it to its proper functions. 
And then finally, we have benefits to the community or society as a whole. So like I said, environmental services. So that's like carbon capture, clean water, clean air, all that good stuff. Um, some conservation easements also have the option to be public accessible. And we all know that along with public accessibility comes um, fitness benefits, um, mental health benefits, mindfulness, and just connection to nature. So when that's an option, that's obviously a benefit to the community. Um, we also have preservation of livelihoods. So a lot of conservation easements, especially in the West, are protecting um, ranching and farming. Um, and that's great because especially here in Colorado, ranching and farming are historical economies here. Um, and so obviously we all know the price, the rising price of property in the West um, is something that farmers and ranchers are facing. Development can typically mean that they can cash out and make a lot of money from that. But conservation easements give farmers and ranchers another option to maintain their land, but also receive some financial benefit from that. So we're maintaining those livelihoods. And then finally, we have educational opportunities. So um, a lot of conservation easements can serve as education for the public. What does it look like when we preserve these lands in perpetuity? And a lot of research can come from these conservation easements. Um, so yeah, so those are just some of the benefits to um, conservation easements. Okay, so since the Mountain Area Land Trust is based in Evergreen, Colorado, we're going to focus on Colorado's population growth in the West um, specifically. So I love to start off with this quote. Um, the West is losing open space to human development at an alarming rate. One football field's worth every two and a half minutes, an area larger than the size of Los Angeles each year, um, which is an astounding <laughs> um, analogy. I'm all about analogies as a communicator. So I think that's great. It kind of puts it into perspective. Um, so Colorado is the sixth fastest growing state in the United States with a growth rate of 15%. The rest of the United States is sitting at about a seven-ish percent growth rate and Colorado is double that. So we're seeing a huge uptick um, in population in this area. Um, and so if you look at this graph, we're, this goes all the way back to 1860, but <laughs> we're gonna focus on the last like 20 years here. So as you can see, it's just an exponential growth rate um, within the last 20 years here in Colorado. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the impacts of population growth. Um, so when we're having population growth, people need places to live. Um, and so with that comes a lot of exurban development. Um, so that's development of roads and bridges and pipelines and infrastructure just to get water to a house or gas. Um, so all of that stuff can heavily fragment um, habitat for um, species. It also interrupts the connectivity, especially for migratory species such as elk or bighorn sheep or mountain lions. Um, so we have lots of habitat for those species. Um, we also have a lots of ecosystem functions. When we develop a wetland, for example, um, that obviously decreases um, the ability to have clean water for it to be naturally filtered. Um, we also have lots of ecosystem services such as carbon capture. Um, and um, we also have lots of livelihoods, such as those historic um, economies that we talked about. Um, and then finally, we have an overall loss of society's health and wellness. Um, when we're developing that property, um, we lose out on not only the ecosystem functions, but also our ability to either recreate or experience those lands. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of impacts of population growth. Um, I also wanted um, to bring up this map here. Um, so this is a map of Colorado's population by county in the last 10 years. Um, at the beginning of my capstone, Park County, which is in um, the Mountain Area Land Trust service area, was the fastest growing. But if you guys live in Colorado, then you know the census just happened. And this was all released this summer. So this kind of changed um, over the time. But as you can see, Weld County, where I grew up, is the fastest growing county here in Colorado with a 30% growth rate, which is wild, especially if you've been there. I'm There was no people when I was there. Um, <laughs> and then we also have this dark blue area, which is Larimer County, where we are here today. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And then if you just go down, this is the front range. Um, and we, as you can see, we have just a lot darker blue area in this 
um, just going along the mountains here, except for this county out here. But yeah, so I just want you to keep that map in mind because we'll touch on that here in a second. Okay, so let's talk about my project partner. Um, so I partner with the Mountain Area Land Trust. For short, I'll refer to them as MALT from now on, just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, not talking about a malt um, <laughs> milkshake. <laughs> um, okay, so they're a nonprofit, non governmental organization. They're a land trust based out of Evergreen, Colorado. They were established in 1992, so they've been operating for a long time. Um, they have protected over 16,000 acres in 82 different private conservation easements. Um, they outright own 162 acres with 92 fee title acquisitions as a part of their new Pennsylvania mountain space area. Um, fee title acquisitions are when um, the, the land trust outright owns that area. Um, so they were donated or gifted um, that whole property, not just development rights. Um, they've also um, helped to conserve close to 6,000 acres through facilitated public projects. And that's where they've worked with um, county and city organizations. So one example is their Floyd, count, um, Floyd Hill open space, where they worked with Jefferson County open space to conserve that land. Jefferson County open space does maintain um, that land and holds the property rights, but um, Malt deeded it to them. Um, Floyd Hill open space is now um, a mountain bike, um, mountain bike uh, recreation area with a lot of new trail systems put on. So that's just a public project that they've facilitated. Um, and so Malt's mission is to save natural areas, wildlife habitat, streams and rivers, working ranches and historic lands for the benefit of the community and as a legacy for future generations. Okay. So um, the Mountain Area Land Trust has a service area and they operate in a six county service area. Park County, Gilpin County, Clear Creek, Teller, and the mountainous regions of Jefferson and Boulder County. Um, so as you can see in this map, um, wow, where did my mouse go? <laughs> um, okay, I'll go here. Um, so this is their um, service area right in this red. So this is the front range like we talked about here. And then they're in the mountainous regions. This is right when you go up I-70, all those initial foothills and mountains. Um, so we're gonna see a lot of use out of this area. People from Denver and the big cities um, looking for some refuge or some solitude up in these mountainous areas. Okay, so within that six county service area, they also have specific priority areas. And this helps them to prioritize where they want to protect um, private land and where they want to place conservation easements. So within their six county service area, they have um, a priority area of the peak to peak area in this pink here, pink here. <laughs> um, Evergreen to Mount Evans is here. Red Rocks to Kenosha Pass, Red Hill to Hoosier Pass, part of Colorado area, and then the 11 mile area. And you can kind of see the larger cities um, over here. Okay, so if you think back to Malt's mission that I shared earlier, um, they're really in the business of protecting species and ecosystems. And so across all their whole priority area, across all six counties, they have identified these habitats as high importance. So riparian habitat, um, string bank buffers, protecting um, our water quality, and then endangered and threatened species, including the preble jumping mouse, montane pawnee skipper, boreal toads, and then they're also protecting other species, including elk, black bears, bighorn sheep, and mountain lions. They're also um, prioritizing scenic values. So when you go up I-70, you see that huge massive ridge line that's completely untouched. They think that that's something worth saving and it's beautiful and it's awesome. Um, so they wanna protect those types of scenic values. We also have cultural and historic values, which include working farms and ranches. Like I touched on earlier, those are historic economies here in Colorado and they wanna save that way of life or that um, livelihood for people who care about that. Okay, so let's go a little bit into the demographics. Um, so malt service area are all bedroom communities of the Denver Boulder metropolitan area. And so by bedroom communities, that means that people are living in those high mountainous regions and commuting into Boulder or Denver for work, which means there's a high number of commuters. Um, if you've also been in that area, 
I-70 and 285 runs right through Mount Service Area. To, or I-70 brings you up to Summit County for skiing. Um, and then 285 brings you down to the Salida area for skiing, mountain biking, rafting, et cetera. Um, so they're experiencing um, a high level of traffic moving through that area. Um, lots of tourism, like I mentioned, a lot of people are government workers, um, also as jobs, and then farmers and ranchers, like we touched on, but overall, their people who live in their service area are private landowners, some with, with a lot of acres, some with smaller acres, um, but overall, they're private landowners, and that's what we're really going to be focusing on um, for this project. Okay, so let's go in a little bit to my project overview. So MALT updated their land and water conservation plan recently in 2021 with the last cohort. Um, so in this plan, they outline a lot of specific goals um, and objectives for each priority area based on conservation, excuse me, conservation values. But also in that, um, that land and water conservation plan, they outline goals for community growth and outreach. Um, so their goal included in this plan is by 2026, MALT has developed new and enhanced old communication strategies to increase the quantity and quality of relationships built with community members and landowners. So obviously with the approval of this plan, MALT has identified a need for outreach, um, which has ultimately led to this project. So they wanted me to develop a communication and outreach plan to supplement um, their land and water conservation plan. Awesome. So for the creation of MALT's Outreach Toolkit, I set some goals and objectives um, for my project. Um, so my goal overall is to increase the number of conservation easements in MALT's service area through the creation of an outreach toolkit. Um, my first objective was to identify community relations in each of MALT's six county service area and to, uh, to inform the outreach plan. My second objective was to create outreach plan, including sections and counties for their ambassador program. Um, and then third was to create outreach collateral. Um, so we'll touch a little bit on the, um, the changing of the objectives in the lessons, lessons learned section. Um, not all of these were completed, but we used some of our adaptive learning um, to deal with <laughs> those adjusting and um, objectives, but we'll touch on that later. So what I quickly started finding out um, was while we did do an annotated bibliography for this project, um, I felt like I wanted a little bit more information. Um, I felt like I needed some more in-depth um, research in order to inform my outreach plan. Um, so what I decided to do was utilize a two-pronged approach. Um, and this was um, qualitative semi-structured interviews that lasted about 30 minutes. And I did this with two different groups of people. One was peer-to-peer -peer interviews with other land trusts across the West. And then um, the other part was interviews with landowners, with MALT's landowners who have already completed conservation easements. Um, so the peer-to-peer -peer interviews um, aim to shine light on the best tools and tactics and outreach, um, outreach plans that land trusts use. Um, and then the interviews with landowners kind of shed a light on that back half of like, how did MALT's um, initial outreach impact them? Did it change their um, knowledge of conservation easements over time? How do they wish that that was different? Um, so I utilized those, that two-pronged approach to inform my outreach plan. Okay, so I interviewed five accredited land trusts from across the West. And these land trusts were chosen based on similar socio-ecological standing to MALT with a um, increasing um, population and decreasing open space availability. Uh, so I interviewed the Summit Land Conservancy in Park City, Utah, the Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Trust, which is based in Arvada, but they operate in Colorado as a whole, the Aspen Valley Land Trust in Carbondale, Colorado, Prickly Pear Land Trust in Helena, Montana, and then also the Eagle Valley Land Trust in Edwards, Colorado. So these are some of the questions I asked land trusts. Um, what are some of the methods you use to reach new landowners? Um, what's been the most and least successful methods? Um, what are the differences between audiences, such as the differences between farmers and ranchers versus maybe a private landowner who has forest land but doesn't use it? Um, what's been the biggest challenge for acquiring new CEs? Um, and then if they have any prioritization, um, such as MALT does, 
and then any methods that they're really wanting to try in the future, trying to get some of those recommendations out of them. Um, so this just helped to inform some tools and tactics that Malt could also um, benefit from. So here's some interesting quotes from land trusts um, from these interviews. Um, first one was, we are here to be a partner. We're not here to be an enforcer or a police agency of any type. We are here to help you and your family accomplish their goals. And that was from Aspen Valley Land Trust. Um, I thought that was interesting um, because that kind of speaks to the misconception of land trusts. Um, another great one was from Prickly Pear Land Trust. Be good, be brief, be gone. That kind of speaks to um, <laughs> the customer service and the approach um, to approaching landowners um, who might be interested in a CE. And then also from the same, um, the same conservation easement specialist, um, do you want money to keep doing what you've always done? Which I think is just a super simplistic way of looking at a conservation easement, which when you first hear that, it's like, how could you say no? Yes, I want money to just keep doing what I've always done. Um, so that'll help inform some of the messaging later on here. All right, so then I interviewed some of Malt's landowners. Um, I interviewed four different landowners um, with varying status and locations. Um, one was on the board of directors, one was a financial advisor, and um, one was the large property owner for Pennsylvania Mountain Open Space, which if you saw earlier was is 500 plus acres. Um, and then others identified themselves as longtime friends of Malt. Um, and I asked them about 10 questions as well. So these are the questions um, to landowners, what initially got them interested in conservation easements, kind of touching on their motives. Um, what ha how has the conservation easement affected your livelihood? How did you find out about malt? Really talking about that outreach. Um, how often do you talk to others about conservation easements? And then if you do, how do you describe that? Um, so kind of honing in on that conservation easement language again. Um, and then if they'd be willing to talk to other neighbors and landowners about conservation easements. So some interesting quotes from landowners are, they're like solar panels on a house, you break even. Like I said, I love analogies. And I thought that this was another great descriptive quote, um, kind of describing how conservation easements are a benefit. People are kind of familiar with solar panels now. Um, so maybe they'll see the um, metaphor there. Um, the financial advisor said that he can resell the property with the CE attached to the land and it won't diminish its worth, which I think again speaks to the financial benefit of a conservation um, easement, also coming from a financial advisor who does this for work. So I think that's a great thing. And then finally, I thought this was for tree huggers and I thought this was for rich people. Um, those again speak to the misconceptions of land trust. Um, I wanna say everyone can do a land trust, which is not really true, but it's definitely just not for people with a higher ec or economic status. And it's not for people who have to be tree huggers. <laughs> all right. So after I did all those interviews, I transcribed and coded all of them. Um, and so I coded them using this code BIC. Um, and so it's really small here, but um, so I coded them into major themes um, and then sub themes. And then I did the frequency of how often those themes appeared in interviews. And then I also pulled some example quotes, some of which you just saw. Um, I also um, pulled out um, some areas for future growth, um, which are just recommendations. We'll see that here in a second. Um, but the major themes were landowner motives, outreach strategies, relationship building challenges in the audiences. Okay, so as you guys may know, I was a communications person in my past life. And while I love the code book, um, I don't think it's a great visual representation of anything. <laughs> um, so I created this uh, word map um, that kind of captured those themes and sub themes um, of those interviews. Um, so this will also be given to Malt as a form of the outreach toolkit. Um, so the best outreach strategies from um, interviews were educational opportunities, real estate connections, community conservation, and then word of mouth. And word of mouth was the number one strategy utilized by all five land trusts across the US or across the West. Um, then we go into landowner motivations. Um, what gets them interested in, in um, conservation easements? And so that's leaving a legacy, their financial position, um, conservation. 
um, and then their family. So maybe they're farmers and ranchers and, and um, that's really important to their family and accomplishing their goals. Then we get into a little bit of the challenges, which is land trust misconception, the upfront costs of CEs. Um, and so that is before you complete a CE, you have to do initial assessments um, and due diligence. And so the landowner does have to pay that upfront cost first. Typically you will get that money back um, in a tax benefit, but you do have to come up with that money first to do the initial assessment. So that can be a big barrier to landowners who may not have that financial um, that financial standing. Then we also have uninterested landowners. You can't work with someone who just does not want to do a conservation easement. And then we have fundraising, and then we also have staff capacity. Um, MALT operates with only a staff of six people. I think it's less now, they had some people leave. Um, so it's a super lean staff. Um, so that can impact the amount of conservation easements they get to. So then we have relationship building qualities was another theme, and that was customer service, trustworthiness, partnerships with other businesses in the community or organizations, and then also good reputation within the community. Those things all impacted whether or not people wanted to work with that land trust. Um, and then we also have landowner identities or the audiences. A lot of them are farmers and ranchers, varying social socioeconomic status. Um, a lot of them are still conservationists. Um, that's a big um, identity still that we're talking about. And then we also have short and long-term owners. Um, so like I said, since population um, is growing, we have a lot of new people moving into these areas that may have only owned their property for a, maybe a year or two. Um, we also have some who've been there for generations. Um, so kind of just reaching all of those um, different owners. All right, and then here's some of the recommendations from other land trusts. I just thought these were interesting um, and these, this will be given to MALT too as ideas to try in the future. Um, one was partnering with other land trusts. Um, like I said, a lot of land trusts have super limited staff capacity. So maybe if they can't get to that conservation easement, um, if another land trust operates in a similar service area, they can refer that person. Um, and that's not necessarily, you're not competing against another land trust because they are all nonprofits and they do all have the same mission. So that was something that um, one professional recommended. Another one was being proactive versus reactive. And this is kind of what my outreach toolkit will touch on. Um, a lot of land trusts will um, do a CE when the landowner comes to them versus going out and reaching out for CEs. We also have NRCS funding or the ability to fundraise to cover those initial assessments or due diligence costs. Some will do that, which I think is a great way to redu reducing barriers for landowners who might be interested. Um, also reaching out to past interests. Um, so people who may have been interested in doing a CE but didn't see the financial benefit. A lot of the laws around conservation easements are changing right now. Um, and so it might be more cost benefit beneficial to them now. Um, we also have buying land and deeding to municipalities. That's something that MAL already practices, such as working with that county open space um, to manage those properties. And then also offering conservation easements 101 for real estate professionals. And then finally, I thought this was a very interesting um, uh, idea was the military compatible use program. Um, military bases typically prefer to do conservation easements around their base areas. Um, that way, if they're flying jets or doing whatever, um, they're not disrupting a community of homes um, around there. So they would much rather prefer to do a conservation easement around their bases. So that could be something to look in for MELT. Awesome. So let's get into the components of the outreach toolkit. First, we have updated external communication and outreach plan, Then we have community building contact lists, community building worksheets, um, a quick guide to land trust outreach, that was that word map that you just saw, um, and then we'll have outreach collateral, and then finally I compiled some additional resources for MALT to consult with. Awesome. So first I did the updated external communication and outreach plan. Their last one was updated in 2012. So it's been a while. It definitely needs some upkeep. Um, this land or this uh, <laughs> outreach plan indicates primary audiences and that's private landowners, community members, and then also major donors, recognizing that that's still a major audience that Malt needs to reach. 
It builds off of goals and objectives set in the land and water conservation plan um, by setting specific strategies for each of those objectives. Um, it also includes updated messaging based on interviews. Um, it utilizes new, new tactics um, such as um, social media, um, <laughs> a newsletter, um, community building resource, newspaper articles, websites, um, and then um, direct mailings and collateral, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and then it also includes a donor section, which was trimmed down for easy understanding. This whole, the old um, communication and outreach plan was about 30-ish pages, um, which I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> after working for um, like larger and smaller governments, having like a huge stack <laughs> of a report is not necessarily something that I want to read or have time to. So that's kind of the design between this outreach toolkit is really just a grab and go thing, a quick reference for you to look at and then go out into the community and, um, you know, and uh, promote malt. And then this is a logic model that I did. Um, so we're really starting off with community outreach, which leads to awareness, which hopefully stimulates word of mouth. We're really um, going for this. And then from word of mouth, hopefully is interest. So they either go on the website or call malt to see if a conservation easement might be in their future. And then finally, the desired action is completing a conservation easement or a donation. And then depending on how that goes, depending on their customer service, um, their reputation, et cetera, that will hopefully stimulate word of mouth too, um, which feeds back into this. Awesome. So here's some updated messaging based on the interviews that I did. Um, so just some, um, some of these will just be used like if you're on a call with a landowner, um, what can you say? What kind of scripts can you say? What kind of messaging do you want to get across? Um, so the first one is we can help you to protect the land for values you care about, help your family accomplish their goals and realize tax benefits. We have excellent, excellent customer service and a wealth of expertise. We are a trusted um, land trust in the community and we are honored to provide support and guidance to landowners. We are a nonprofit organization that listens to the landowner's vision. We are trusted partners and share your commitment to leaving a legacy. And then also the final and my favorite one is we don't want to manage your land, we want to help you protect it. Um, and I think that this is the best one. Um, the professional from Prickly Pear Land Trust um, offered this as a um, as an updated messaging. Um, and how he phrases it when he talks to landowners is, let's say we're talking to a farmer or rancher. It's like, we as a land trust are not in the business of um, ranching. We don't know how to raise cattle. We don't know how to get them to market. That's not what we do. You're the professional in that. We just want to help support you do that lifestyle. We're partners, but we're not enforcers. So really speaking to that. So I thought that's great. Making the landowner feel like they're the export, which they are. Awesome. So then we, the second part of this outreach toolkit is community building contact list. So I compiled over 20 different contacts of names, numbers, emails, websites um, for communities within malt service area. And I divided it up into cities or towns within those priori priority areas, knowing that you know, community, um, community events typically happen um, within towns. Um, it was a little bit difficult because malt does have a lot of unincorporated towns in their service area, but this gets as close to a community um, building or event as we can. Um, so some notable highlights from this long list <laughs> um, is rec center programming, um, maybe offering um, a hike, a, a tour or a hike with um, adults on a conservation easement and explaining what the con conservation easement does. Um, similar to that is public library programming, possibly offering um, a conservation 101 class or another hike out of the library. Um, also partnering with the CSU Extension Office in Park County. I think that's a really awesome partnership for Malt to pursue because they do have very similar missions as far as protecting, um, protecting historic um, ranching and farming um, and also has an environmental focus. So I think that'd be an awesome um, partnership for Malt. And then finally, we have real estate continuing education classes within the service area. I'm very thankful to my partner, Tana, <laughs> for letting me know about this idea. But each year, real estate professionals do need to take a continuing education class. Um, and so MALT could offer Conservation Easement 101 as an elective for um, real estate professionals to do. Um, and so that's required for them. Um, and then would also build on those real estate connections that was one of the best outreach strategies indicated in that um, word map. 
Okay, and so then um, to partner with that community building contact list, we also have community building worksheets. And so this is something similar that we use at my current job is at Fort Collins Natural Areas, um, but this kind of just guides initial meetings with um, community partners. So these worksheets are divided into two different steps. The first guides the initial meeting with community contact and overlap permission. Um, so this kind of just um, guides the meeting and you really just want to listen without purpose. Um, just really form that initial relationship, have no agenda type of thing. And then we also, the second one also dives deeper and outlines activities in which MALT can partner with the community entity. So kind of doing that planning step um, and, really, and really making an action plan. Um, and so I like these worksheets because it helps to keep track of progress and documents relationship building. Relationship building can often be a, a gray area and it's hard to tell if you're making progress or not. Um, and so these worksheets help to document that. And then also I think it's great because it can help guide MALT within these initial meetings. This isn't something that they've ever done before. Um, so I think this is just a great resource for them to have to see how this, how the process should go. Awesome. And then finally, we have additional resources. I included the NAAEE Community Engagement Guidelines for Excellence. It's an awesome booklet um, that has anything and everything from programming to outreach to mailings, etc. Um, so I want to include that in the toolkit. Um, my mindset here is why reinvent the wheel if we already have these awesome resources available to us. I also included the continuum of choices, changing public behavior by the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This kind of hints on that social marketing framework of how to change people's behavior. And I thought that'd be a great resource for Malt to um, review. And finally, that annotated bibliography that we all had to complete for this capstone project. Awesome. So then we get into the outreach collateral. So I did, this is just mailings and print media. So I did two postcards to be mailed to private landowners and then one brochure. I passed them all out to you at the beginning so you can look at them um, and see how <laughs> they feel in your hands. <laughs> um, so the first postcard, um, I came up with this tagline, protecting what you love just got more rewarding. Um, so recently, the Colorado legislator, le legislature passed HB 102, I think is the number. <laughs> um, and so that heavily increased the amount of money um, that private landowners can get back for donating a conservation easement. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the percentage before, but I do know that this is a heavy increase. 90% is almost 100% of the value that you would get back. So you're really breaking even on a lot of that. Um, so this is a huge law for Colorado, um, and so MALT obviously wants to inform their service area that it's really, if it wasn't financially rewarding before, it definitely is now. Um, so they wanted to get that out. We also have just a general one, which is meet your local land trust. Um, so like I said, since there's um, a lot of people moving into the area, um, a lot of people might not know that they have a local land trust or might not know that conservation easement could be an option for them. Um, and so this one just kind of um, is a, like a meet and greet um, through the mail, <laughs> um, but it just shares their mission statement and what they do. And then if they wanna learn more information, they can visit their website. Um, so just kind of making that introduction with people who may not know about MALT. And then finally, we have the brochure. Um, and so this is kind of a shorthand guide um, to one of Malt's other resources. They have a landowner packet, which is about 10 to 12 pages. So it's a lot of details that are important, but it's not, necessarily, not something that you necessarily want to hand to someone who does not know about conservation easements in general. That's kind of like the next step after they're like, yes, I want to do this. And then they consult that document. So this is kind of the first initial one. So it outlines the benefits of conserving your land, this process that it takes to do that, um, and then just has some generic um, background about malt, such as the acres they've conserved, their mission, et cetera. Awesome. So now we kind of jump into um, learnings and limitations. Um, so I did do qualitative interviews with both landowners and land trusts. And I do think that the landowner part of this would have benefited from a qualitative um, method instead. Um, I think I would have been able to reach a lot more landowners if I had done something like a survey versus an interview. Some of the questions did end up being yes or no. Um, 
And I think, you know, landowners are really busy people. They don't do that for a living. They're also professionals. They're lawyers, financial advisors. They just happen to have a conservation easement. Um, so I think I could have gotten more responsive responses if, if I did a survey instead. Um, also adjusting to COVID. Um, obviously this summer it felt like its restrictions kind of lifted a little bit and so i think everyone was just trying to figure out where they stand what events can they have people were just going back into the office um, so a lot of the research for community building contact stuff was um, virtual um, which obviously makes things a little bit harder since things just weren't in person quite yet um, but we adjusted to that and it's all a learning process for everyone um, also adjusting objectives like i had mentioned earlier um, I did have an objective of creating an ambassador program, um, but what I quickly learned when I was interviewing these landowners is a lot of people either didn't live in the service area, didn't live in the state, <laughs> or quite frankly, a lot of them um, are older individuals and they aren't necessarily interested in being boots on the ground type of people. Like I said, they have other jobs and other responsibilities. So um, that was something I wasn't able to accomplish, but I do still feel like this outreach toolkit um, will be a great um, resource for MALT. Another limitation is long-term monitoring. Um, obviously I was only with them for about three or four months. Um, so I'm not able to actually prove if they got more conservation easements this year. Um, but for that, I suggest that Malt do a um, feedback questionnaire after people complete conservation easements and just say, how was this experience? Um, what were the best customer service qualities? Would you recommend this to friends? And then also see if they would possibly be interested in doing that ambassador program. Um, so I think that'd be a great long-term monitoring thing. And then finally, um, time management and balancing projects. Um, a lot of you may know I started um, work with the Fort Collins Natural Areas. And so that's been a lot of, <laughs> it's been really fun, a lot of learning and very busy. So balancing that with this project too was a lot of <laughs> learning, um, but I am proud of what I was able to accomplish in both of those. Um, and so, yeah, I just thought I'd be honest about that part. <laughs> Okay, and then just some reflections. Um, so this summer, that's a picture of me um, doing conservation easement monitoring with MALT. We are able to go to three or four different properties in this service area and do long-term monitoring where we go to different parts to make sure um, that um, nothing's being developed or the ecological integrity is still intact. It's a lot of photo analysis, which is great. You get to walk around such beautiful properties and take pictures all day. So I loved it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I got to see some beautiful landscapes and then also some very beautiful homes, I will say. Um, and then also um, this project was extremely relevant to my current job as a public engagement specialist. Um, I am doing a lot of mailings um, to inform community members and I do a lot of community outreach. Um, so the overlap between the two is just, you know, uncanny. It's, it's great. So there's a big benefit to that. And then finally, making connections, especially with all of those other land trusts. I feel like I was really able to grow my network um, and really become interested in this um, new subject, this new um, type of organization that I've always been interested in. So I got to learn a lot more. Um, I also did apply for a job as a land um, conservation specialist. I didn't get it, but I did feel like I knew um, a lot more than I had originally. So I felt a lot more prepared, which was awesome. Um, so finally, I just want to thank my project partner, Mountain Area Land Trust, um, for their um, willingness to teach me new things and be a great um, supporting partner. Um, I'm also thankful to all the land trusts who are so generous in letting me interview them and sharing their knowledge with me. And then of course, um, CLTL for providing background um, and support and especially my fellow cohort members um, <laughs> for helping me through this project when I was stressed. <laughs> um, yeah, and then finally, thanks to my family and friends. Um, they're all great um, in letting me practice my presentation and everything with them. So overall, it's been a really great summer um, with a lot of learning, and I'm really proud of what I got to accomplish this summer. So thanks, everyone, for coming to my presentation. Um, here's a few sources, and then I'll ask for questions now. Thank <laughs> you.